blockchain is the most overrated and misunderstood new technology right now. And I'm not the only one who thinks this. So Rubini is a senator who was asked to research Bitcoin and go to Congress and speak about it. And what he said is that Bitcoin is the mother of all scams and the underlying technology is overhyped and least useful technology in human history. Well, I wouldn't quite take it that far, but it's definitely overhyped. Now, one thing you need to know about blockchain is that it is open source. So the first one, there was a research paper done and it was put out on GitHub and that was Bitcoin. But all the different blockchains, variations, however it's being used, is based on the same source code. Now, here's another study that was done by the register. And they went out and they surveyed 43 different blockchain solutions. And they got 0% success rate. They either didn't respond or they couldn't say that it was successful. So these are common myths. It's as secure as a TLS channel. And I heard a CEO of a robotics company say this. He said, the way you go to your bank now using TLS and you know secure web session, you'll just use blockchain. And I thought, okay, he's a robotics expert. He doesn't understand blockchain. Blockchain's immutable. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this. It will replace databases. I don't think Oracle's too concerned. It will replace PKI. Hold on a second, there's actually certificates in Bitcoin. Blockchain has built-in disaster recovery. No, sorry, and it's not DDoS proof. So here's another wild claim that was made. The CIO of JP Morgan said blockchain will replace existing technology. Sorry, but we're still gonna have computers, databases, and you know, all the regular things. Now, it just, she wanted to grab the headlines, but she obviously doesn't understand the you know, technology behind it. But I will say this, I actually agree with JP Morgan's use case. They are actually using Ethereum, and they're creating their own blockchain, and this is gonna be a consortium of banks and they're gonna do inter and intra-bank transactions. And so what they said is, is they're not gonna to have to have a third party that's reviewing these transactions and have to have the special golden copy of the audit trail, which I think this is a good use case. So there's all these different ways blockchain's being used. It started out as Bitcoin, and there's all these different alternate currencies, which because it's open source, you can actually create your own digital currency. Now, the thing is, you've got to get enough people to trust it, to use it, and to have it be worth something. So the big one after Bitcoin is Ethereum, but there's all these other uses that we, you know, people, IBM and different companies have come up with. So we've got, it essentially is a distributed ledger, but they're using it for food safety and um, the IBM supply chain for diamonds. IBM's using it for the diamond industry. Also smart contracts and IOT um, for the blockchain. Okay, so I wanted to take a step back to, because to really understand what blockchain is, you have to understand a hash function. And you may be thinking, oh gosh, what is this? I wanna learn about blockchain, not hashing. But this is a very simple concept that I think a lot of people don't understand. So a hash function is a digital fingerprint of a document, email, piece of code. And essentially in this example, I have a Word document and I put in the exact same letters in two different documents. I ran the hashing function, SHA-256, and I got this hash value, and you can see it's equal. The importance of this is that you get integrity, because if I send this document to someone else and they run the same hash function, they know 
there isn't a space and there isn't a change to the document. Well, in this slide, you'll see that I actually made a change and lo and behold, the hash function changed. So we know now something changed, so it gives us integrity. But the thing to understand is, is that the actual information is not being encrypted. It's just this fingerprint of the document. That's what the hash function is. So on this next one, the other thing you have to understand is digital signatures. And I'm not talking about when you sign something, you go and you sign something and you, you know, they make it into a digitized um, signature. What I'm talking about is an encrypted hash value. So on the blockchain, essentially, each transaction is um, hashed and then that hash value is encrypted. Okay, so the tricky part is, is it's just the hash value being encrypted, nothing else. And that's one thing I want you to think about. So there's no way that this can actually be the same as like a TLS encrypted channel. So what is blockchain? Well, I'm giving you two different ways. I'm giving you, you know, the graphical if you're a visual learner and then also the definition. So at its core, it's a peer-to-peer -peer distributed ledger that is cryptographically secure, append only, immutable, which I love the way they have it in parentheses, extremely hard to change because immutable means you can't change it, and updatable only via consensus or agreement among peers. And when everything's working properly, that is how blockchain works. Now, the one thing I have, and if you can go back real quick, that gets me is cryptographically secure. To me, when you say cryptographically secure, I'm thinking it's encrypted. You're not going to be able to read it. And in this case, that's not exactly what's going on. We're just, we have the encrypted hash value. And then the other thing is the immutable, and we're going to talk more about this on the, on the next slide, so you can... So essentially, blockchain is immutable, is what the definition says. But there's actually this 51% attack. And what it means is, is that in blockchain, the longest chain wins. And in Ethereum, and this happened just two weeks after Ethereum was in existence, and remember when I said it's open source? Well, someone knew there was a bug in it. And what they did is secretly, they mined Ethereum without anybody else knowing. And in the first two weeks, they mined a chain that was longer than the longest chain. They brought it online and they basically, everybody's Ethereum just went to zero and they suddenly had $50 million. So you can't quite say it's immutable when it can actually this longest chain can be um, overdone, not, not overwritten, but taken over, I guess is what I want to say. So what we have with blockchain is it's completely distributed and it's based on the client. There's no backend. So when you go to install the client, you can choose and go to bitcoin.org. You can say, well, I just, all I want to do is buy and sell some Bitcoin. So you get a client node. Then there's a full node that has a full copy of the blockchain. It's not really a database, but you can kind of think about it, but the full you know, chain on your local machine. You don't actually want to do that though because there's things on the Bitcoin blockchain because it's public, such as links to child porn and people have been doxxed, their names, pictures, things like this. So, the thinking is that a nation state put those in there so that they could come into your house and say, oh, you've got child porn on your machine and arrest you. So you don't really want to have the full node. And then the other one's the minor node, and those are the nodes where they're actually able to mine the Bitcoin and you know, make more Bitcoin and actually get paid a certain percentage. But these hash, the chain is so long on Bitcoin, the hash is, everything is hashed. Like every transaction, 
every single hash is checked up to the very first transaction that was ever done on Bitcoin. So now it's extremely computer intensive to do run these hashes. So only you have to have like, you know, huge data power, you know, machines and things like this to do it. So the average person is not able to actually mine Bitcoin. But I did want to do a little thing about the 51% attack in the spring. There's only three main miners now in Bitcoin, and there were some illegal transactions that were done. And two of the miner, the main miners, they just basically they redid that longest chain because they said, oh, some invalid transactions. So it was the 51% attack. And at the time, people said, well, those, the, the um, transactions were illegal. So it was good they went and undid them. But it also makes you think it's not, you know, it's not immutable, essentially. So this is one of the things to think about, is on the client machine, when you download the client, it generates your private key. This is also where your Bitcoin stored. And that particular key, if you do not have good entropy, entropy is completely random data. So you generate the cryptographic key and then it grabs this random data to make the key more secure so you, you know, can't figure out what it is. So it's unique. Well, if you just have a regular computer and you don't have good entropy, you'll have a weak key. And so with ECDSA, which is actually being used with Bitcoin, there's only 256 possible keys that you can have. And we saw this in the spring where people were just, their Ethereum keys were being guessed and there was 54 million um, dollars stolen because of weak keys. And here's just an example of entropy is that you have to have this noise source and it's digitized where we're trying to, you know, make this random data. But if you have just a regular computer at home or your phone, you probably do not have good entropy. And to get good entropy, you really need to have a hardware entropy processor like Act2 Lite or Cavium or a high-end processor that has like an Intel chip with onboard entropy processor. So essentially, unless you have like a really um, high-end server, you're probably not getting good entropy. But in order to protect your, um, your wallet, it basically goes back to good cybersecurity hygiene. You wanna have a strong password, two-factor authentication, offline storage of your wallet, and that's just like a regular you know, printout that you store somewhere. And another thing is the um, wallet's encrypted with AES CBC mode, which CBC mode has known weaknesses. So that's another not good thing. And so should you use blockchain? Well, some of the things you need to think about is what are you using it for? The data that's on the blockchain is not going to be encrypted. So it needs to be public information. So when, when you're, um, you know, reading a story about blockchain or trying to understand it, most of them, like 95% of them, are either someone that has a blockchain product that they want to sell you or they're somehow they have like a digital currency that they want you to buy. So you just need to think about, you know, what you want to use it for and that it's done in a secure manner.